Hello everyone, and welcome to some applications of Newton's second law, rotational version. So here's our first problem, and you can read through the problem. We've got a cylinder here. Um, we're assuming here that the, uh, I believe that the cylinder is a disc, right? It's a solid cylinder from the picture. We've got four different forces being applied at different places along the way. And we want to know the magnitude and direction of the angular acceleration of the cylinder, assuming that somehow these forces stay the same size and the same angles as this thing spins. That would be kind of hard to figure out how to do, but let's say we had it set up that way. So this is a basic torque and angular acceleration problem, which means we need to apply Newton's second law, which says that the net torque is equal to the angular acceleration times the rotational inertia, or torque is I alpha. Now, in this case, we've got four forces, which would lead to four torques. But before we just start throwing stuff into here, let's take a look at these torques and notice that one of them here is actually zero. Which one? Well, hopefully you're saying, hey, it's torque four. Why? Because notice that the extension of torque four, the lever arm, if you will, goes through the axis of rotation. So if you're pulling straight out, you're not going to end up getting any rotation due to that. There'll be no turning effect, no torque. Now, why did I call T1 positive and T2 and T3 negative? Well, because T1 due to F1 would make it rotate counterclockwise, whereas torque two and torque three would make it rotate clockwise. Remember, counterclockwise is positive, clockwise is negative. You've got to be careful here that you get all of the directions in here. Technically, we're not sure which way it's going to end up going, but it'll pop out as we solve for alpha. So in each case, torque is, of course, RF sine theta. But in all three of these, notice, they are 90 degrees to the radii, tangent to the disk, if you will. And so that's sine of 90. Sine of 90 is 1. So each torque is RF. But we've got to be a little careful here that we apply the right R and the right F. So be a little careful when you're writing those down. And if this is a disk, we know that the rotational inertia of a disk is 1 half MR squared. Again, we've got to be careful. We need to use R2, which is the entire radius of the disk here. And so it's R2 squared. Plug all those things in. Torque 1 is R2, F1. Torque 2 is R2, F2. And torque 3 is R1, F3. And I is 1 half MR2 squared. Now, since they didn't make these all the same radius, we can't just cancel stuff out. Right? You've got to be a little careful here with your algebra. But we can solve for alpha and get this massive equation. Plug all of our many, many numbers in. Again, being careful that we're getting the right numbers in the right place, which is why it is very helpful to use subscripts. If we do that all correctly, we should get a rotational acceleration of 9.7 radians per second squared. Now you might say, but wait a minute, where do those units come from? Well, let me show you. And units would, of course, be torque units over rotational inertia units, Newton meters over kilogram meters squared. So right away, one of the meters cancel. But remember that a Newton is a derived unit. It itself is a kilogram meter per second squared. So the kilograms cancel. The meters cancel, and remember when you don't have anything, you can put in the name radian, and so it's radians per second squared. So that is the angular acceleration of this cylinder with four different forces at different angles applied. Notice, basically a net torque is I alpha, but since it's rotating, everything's a little more complex to calculate. Second example. This is a problem out of your uh, book, actually. This is an actual door here. Uh, it's a door at Lawrence Livermore Laboratory. It was at one point at least the world's heaviest hinged door. I'm imagining that these hinges there, if you look at these things coming out of them, got to be some sort of hydraulic hinges here. Um, this was some door. I think they did radioactive things inside of this, so they needed this big, heavy door in order to uh, protect people on the outside. Here's this woman out here who's pushing on the door and making it swing. Kind of interesting, right? So the door has a mass of 44,000 kilograms. It has a rotational inertia about this axis of 8.7 times 10 to the fourth kilogram meters squared and a width, which is this dimension this way, right? The width is 2.4 meters. This is a huge door. Assuming no friction, big assumption here, must have really good hydraulic hinges. 
if she applies a constant force at the outer edge and perpendicular to the plane of the door, so she's getting the maximum effect, uh, what force would it need to move it through a 90 degree angle in 30 seconds? It's a pretty long time to be applying a force. This isn't just some door to the room here, okay? It's a huge door. So here's the door. This is looking down at it, if you will. The axis of rotation is over here. The force is being applied at this edge and perpendicular to the plane of the door. And the door is 2.4 meters wide. So there's a little diagram of what's going on, right? A little force diagram. Technically, there are forces here, but they're all radial, and so they don't really apply uh, a torque anyway. So this is the only, only force that is going to do anything here. So as we've seen here, net torque is I alpha. Problem. <laughs> we don't know the torque. And we don't know alpha. So we have too many unknowns in this equation. However, we do know some things about the motion of the door. It starts at rest, moves through a 90 degree angle in 30 seconds if there is a steady force. Steady means constant means, that's right, kinematic equations. So we know that the uh, angular displacement is negative 90 degrees, except that's not going to work in the equation. We can't put 90 degrees into a kinematic equation. So we're going to have to convert that. That, of course, is negative pi over 2 radians. Uh, by the way, why is it negative? Well, it's negative because in the picture, this would make it rotate clockwise. So let's be consistent with our diagram. Right? So negative pi over 2 radians. The time is 30 seconds. The initial angular velocity, omega sub O, is 0 radians per second. So use the ever popular third kinematic equation. Initial angular velocity times the time is 0. Solve for alpha. Plug in your numbers. And you get negative 3.49 times 10 to the negative third radians per second squared. Notice that's negative 0 0.00349 radians per second squared. So this thing is not accelerating very quickly at all, uh, which is really going to have to happen because otherwise you're going to need a huge force, right? So now we know the angular acceleration. So we can go back and try to find the torque. And from the torque, find the force. Now, the nice thing about this problem is there's only one torque. The torque is a clockwise torque, which makes it negative. Notice that the angular acceleration will also be negative, so the negatives will cancel out. The torque is, of course, RF sine theta, but theta in this case is 90, which is 1. So solving for F, we get negative I alpha over R. Those are all things we know. Notice that the meter cancels with uh, this meter up here. Right? And so we get kilogram meters per second squared, which are newtons and the two negatives cancel. So we get a force of 130 newtons, which is about 28 pounds, which is a fairly reasonable force. I mean, yeah, she's going to have to push on it for 30 seconds, but 28 pounds is not a very hard push. You just have to constantly apply it right, in order to move this massive, massive door. It's kind of a cool little real problem there. One of the big assumptions we made, <laughs> only one torque and that was from her force. Therefore, we assumed that there was no frictional effects whatsoever, which, of course, if there were, would make this a very hard door to move. So there's example number two. Ah, great example number three. We've got a modified Atwood's machine. Two equal masses, right? one on the track, one on here. Um, there's not any friction between the table and the sliding block. And then we have a pulley. But unlike the modified Atwood's machines we've used in class, this pulley is not so light and frictionless that we can consider it to be negligible. This pulley has a mass and a radius r. Now, the nice thing about this problem is that the mass of the pulley is the same as the mass of the objects. That's going to help us cancel some things out later on. It certainly doesn't have to be. Uh, let's see here. The radius of the pulley is r. When this system is released, it's found that the pulley turns through an angle theta in a time t, and therefore the acceleration of the blocks would be constant. Right? This is a modified Atwood's machine, after all. Constant forces give rise to uniformly accelerated motion. I want all my answers, since there's no numbers here, in terms of m, r, theta, t, and g only. No other variables allowed. 
Everybody okay with the problem? Might have to hit pause and read it again here. Okay. Notice one thing here, a couple things. The string does not slip on the pulley. Key. So there is friction between the string and the pulley. It's not known whether there is friction between the table and the sliding block. Sorry, earlier I think I said there wasn't any, but there actually there might be. We don't know. But the pulley's axle is frictionless. There we go. So there's no friction with the pulley axle here. But he got it? Okay. First of all, the acceleration is going to be constant or uniform, if you will, which means kinematic equations apply. So we know that the angular acceleration is what we're trying to find here in part A. We know that the uh, angular displacement is theta. We know that the time is t. And we know that it starts from rest, because it's from when it is released. So omega sub o is 0. Using the ever popular third kinematic equation and solving for alpha, we get an alpha of 2 theta over t squared. Allowable variables, right? So there's our answer. Again, big thing here that we got to realize is that we have a uniform acceleration, and we're given enough quantities here in the statement that we can just find it with a kinematic equation. Now, part B, what is the linear acceleration of the two blocks? Well, here's a key thing again. The string does not slip on the pulley. That means that the outside of the pulley has to be moving the same as the string, and the string, of course, is moving the same as the blocks. So therefore, the linear acceleration of the blocks is the same as the linear acceleration of the outside of the pulley. Okay, this is kind of like the device we used in the labs, right? No slippage of the string on the pulley. So that means that the tangential acceleration of the outside of the pulley has to be equal to alpha r. And the acceleration of the blocks is the acceleration, linear acceleration of the outside of the pulley. And alpha, we found earlier, so plug that in. We get 2 theta r over t squared, all allowable variables. With me there? This is a step that very often they wouldn't ask for in an actual AP problem. They would just assume that you could figure that out. So again, think of the, uh, the physics behind this. The string doesn't slip on the pulley. Therefore, the outside of the pulley must be accelerating linearly the same as the masses. All right, so therefore, the uh, acceleration of the outside of the pulley is the tangential component of the acceleration, and that is alpha r. Right? Okay. Now that we know that, the next part we want to know is what is T1 and T2? What are the tensions in the string? Now you might think, this is a weird question, because when we've used modified Atwood's machines before, the question's always been just what's the tension in the string, singular. But in this case, but in those cases, sorry, we were assuming that the pulley was negligible. In this case, it's not. So as you're going to see, that's going to affect the uh, comparison of the two tensions here. Now, I'm going to call these T1 and T2, which is kind of a common AP thing to do. We could call it F of T1 and F of T2, but I'm just going to use the symbols in the problem here, okay? Remember, we have to answer this in these terms. Well, let's do some force diagrams. Here is the mass on the table. What forces act? Well, of course, gravity from the center of gravity, which would be the center of mass. Normal force from the uh, surface, uh, surface block uh, contact point, sorry, from there. It is not accelerating up and down, so the normal force and the force of gravity have to be equal. There is a tension 1 acting to the right from the string, and there may or may not be friction. We're not sure if there is friction, which means we've got too many unknowns in this to use this block to find anything, because right? we don't know what friction is. Right. If there wasn't any friction, we might be able to solve for T1 here. But since there might be, by the way, if there is, how big would that friction have to be? It would have to be less than T1. Why? Because this block has to accelerate to the right, and therefore there must be a net force to the right. Okay, so not enough information. Right. We could write out our equation just for practice, right? Net force in the horizontal is MAX. T1 minus friction is positive MA, positive because it would accelerate to the right. T1 is positive, it's to the right. F of FK is to the left, negative. Please be consistent with your coordinate systems. Up to the right is positive, 
down to the left are negative. Counterclockwise is positive rotation. Clockwise is negative rotation. Be consistent. Since we have two unknowns here, we can't use uh, that equation. Let's look at the hanging mass. Only two forces on the hanging mass, gravity acting at the center of gravity, and the tension in the string. How big is that tension in the string? Hopefully you're saying, hey, it's got to be smaller. Why does it have to be smaller? Because this block is accelerating downward, and therefore the net force must act downward. Don't forget Newton's second law just because some things are rotating. So net vertical force has to equal ma. The m is capital M. The acceleration is down, which makes it negative. T2 is up. F of g is down. So T2 minus F of g is the net force that e has to equal negative ma. Solve for T2. Plug in mg and the a we found just a few moments ago, the linear acceleration of the masses. And if you want to get fancy, you could factor out an m. <laughs> and there is tension 2, the lower section, in terms that we are allowed to use in the problem. Notice here, this is the force of gravity, and we are subtracting this off, which means that the tension 2 is indeed smaller than the force of gravity. If you screw up and like put a positive there so that you're adding it, it would make it look like T2 was bigger, which it can't be because it's accelerating downward. Think and make sure that your answers make consistent sense with your force diagrams. That's why we draw them. Now, we know T2, but we're kind of stuck with T1. But unlike when we've done modified Atwood's machines before, we've got a third object that is not negligible. We've got the pulley. We're considering the pulley to be a disc. All right? uh, it's called the disc pulley here. All right? Sometimes pulleys will be approximated as hoops. Um, if all of their mass is around the outside. But in this case, we're going to assume it's a nice disk. There will, of course, be two torques, one from tension 1, which is going to go to the right, and one from tension 2, which is going to go down. Now, how big do these two forces need to be? Well, hopefully you're saying T2 must be larger than T1. Why? Well, because for this thing to move and for the string not to slip on the pulley, the pulley has to rotate clockwise. And for the pulley to rotate clockwise, right, the, tent, the torque sorry, from 2 has to be larger than the torque from 1 so that it predominates. And the only way that's going to happen is if T2 is greater than T1. So in order to make the angular acceleration clockwise, that's an alpha, right? T2's got to be greater than T1. Again, you should think through these things when you're drawing your force diagrams. So let's sum the torques. That equals I alpha, Newton's second law rotationally. There are two torques. Torque 1 would be positive because it's clockwise. Torque 2 would be negative because it's counter, or sorry, uh, torque 1 is positive because it's counterclockwise. Torque 2 is negative because it's clockwise. And the angular acceleration is also negative because this would end up rotating clockwise. Notice how we've gotten rid of all of the vectors in one step, and be consistent with your coordinate systems. Counterclockwise is positive, clockwise is negative. Now, in each case, T1 and T2 are going to be tangent to the pulley, kind of like when we've wrapped strings around pulleys in the past and in our labs. So the angle is 90, and the sine of 90 is 1, so each torque is simply RF. And since this is a disk pulley, the rotational inertia is 1 half mr squared. And this is the same m. Right? They could make this problem hardy, harder if the pulley was a different mass than the uh, other two blocks. But in this case, they're all capital M. So plugging everything in, torque 1 is r times t1. Torque 2 is r times t2. The rotational inertia is 1 half mr squared. And the angular acceleration we found in an earlier part is 2 theta over t squared. And now we just have to solve. So one of the r's over here cancels out these two r's because they're in every term. The 1 half and the 2 cancel out. So we're left with t1 minus t2 equals this. Solve for t1 because that's what we're looking for. And notice here, 
T2 is smaller than T1. Right? T2 is, um, I'm sorry, <laughs> backwards again. T1 is smaller than T2 because we're subtracting this off it, right? As we said we had to have over here to make a clockwise rotation. T1, again, is going to be smaller than T2 by that amount. Now, T2 is not an allowed variable, right? So this is not the answer yet. Fortunately, we have T2 in terms of allowed variables. Here they are. And it would be nice if we could combine like terms, which we have here and we have here. Notice they're both negative. So that's going to be 3 right here. And here we have that. And if you really want to be fancy, you could factor out an M. Notice again, T1 will be smaller than T2. And T2 will be smaller than f of g. <laughs> and t1 is even smaller than f of g, because there's three of these where there were only two of these here, right? Everything has to be consistent as you're working through, even if you're not working through with numbers. So t2 is greater than t1 as required. So hope you get a good look at this one and if you need to go back because there's a lot going on here right we're doing three force diagrams sometimes the force diagrams are useful right sometimes they're not so useful we have to worry about what's bigger than what as we do these things in order to get the correct direction of the accelerations right we've got to deal with rotational quantities as well as linear quantities and be able to go back and forth and if we do that we can solve these fairly complex things. So notice here that a modified Atwood's machine is really more complex when we have to consider the pulley along with the two masses. We can't look at it as just one big system anymore because the pulley is moving differently than the two blocks. So we have to look at them as three separate objects. No way around it. It's long, but it can be done. So I hope you've enjoyed these Newton's second law examples with using rotation and sometimes linear.